The focus of this lecture is reviewing how to choose the right statistical test for each hypothesis. I'll be reviewing the independent samples t-test, the dependent samples t-test, the simple ANOVA, bivariate correlation, and a simple regression. I'm going to start with a quick overview of each of these tests, and then I'll go into each one in more detail. The first three of these tests, the independent samples t-test, the dependent samples t-test, and the ANOVA, are all used to compare means. In addition, the independent variable for each of these tests is qualitative, or nominal. That means the independent variable is group membership. And finally, the dependent variable is something quantitative in the independent samples t-test, the dependent samples t-test, and in the simple ANOVA. Now, there are variations of some of these tests, including ANOVA. There's lots of different variations of ANOVA, but I'm looking at the simplest version of one-way ANOVA. In this, these three are true. Now, let's look at the similarities in correlation and regression. Here I'm talking about bivariate correlation, that's two variable correlation, and simple regression. In fact, for all five of the tests today, I'm going to focus on them being bivariate. That means each one is going to have a hypothesis that only has two variables, even though some of these tests can be built up to include more than two variables. Correlation and regression can be used when all or both of the variables of interest are quantitative. I said all here because you could have more than two variables with correlation and regression, but I'll be talking mostly about when you just have two variables. So for correlation and regression, both the independent variable and the dependent variable are quantitative. And I'm going to emphasize this is usually true because in some cases these are flexible and can be used with non-quantitative variables, but we'll be leaving those out of our discussion today because our focus is the common and basic use of each of these techniques. The correlation and regression also seek to find relationships, and these relationships can be seen or plotted on a linear graph. You may recall from previous classes or other lectures you've watched online, the use of the x and y axis to plot lines. When you see these kinds of graphs, or even the dot version of this kind of graph, which could look like this, Okay, then you have the foundation that's used for both the correlation and regression technique. This is at least the visual component of the technique. Mathematically, when we use the formulas for these two techniques, the graph is not necessarily overtly created. With that foundation in mind, let's take a detailed look at each of these scenarios and which kinds of hypotheses best fit each of these tests. We'll start by looking at the independent samples t-test. The independent samples t-test is used to compare the means of two distinct groups. Suppose I hypothesize that a group of people given strawberry juice with a little bit of dye in it will like it less than people who are given the same juice when it's colored with more food coloring. If my hypothesis is that those who are given the juice with less of the food coloring will like it less than those who are given the juice with more food coloring, then I have members of two distinct groups that I'm trying to compare. Of course, to test a hypothesis, we would need to have samples. That's more than one person in each group. You wouldn't do an independent samples t-test if you only had one person in each group. So essentially what we're saying in this hypothesis is that we have two distinct groups with two different experiences and that nobody in the first group is also in the second group, that the groups do not overlap, they are distinct from one another. So I hypothesize that those who had less dye in their drink will like the juice less on average than folks who had more dye in their juice. So here I have two distinct groups being compared, and I'm stating that I think the first group will like the juice less. In a scenario where we've clearly stated that of two distinct groups, one of them will have a lower score and we're identifying which group that will be, we use what's called a one-tailed or directional hypothesis. Now suppose that instead I had hypothesized that group one would like the juice more than group two, that the less dye group would like it more than the more dye group. 
Yet again, I would use a one-tailed test because we have a direction stated in our hypothesis. Now suppose that instead, I had simply hypothesized that the two groups would be different in how much they liked the drink. Well, in this case, I'm not specifying which group I expect to have more, group one or group two. I'm just specifying they're going to be different. So there's two possible outcomes here that are both part of my hypothesis. It's that group one has the higher score and group two has the lower score and that group one has the lower score while group two has the higher score. In these scenarios, we would use a two-tailed test because we have a two-tailed or non-directional hypothesis. But all of these use the independent samples t-test. The dependent samples t-test, also known as a paired samples t-test, is used in a different kind of scenario. When we want to compare one group to itself at two different points in time, like before or after an intervention, or if we want to compare the group under different circumstances, such as when they're watching a scary movie versus a funny movie, we can use the dependent samples t-test. The key component here is that it's one group being compared to itself. So though there's data from two time points, we've got two groups of data, it's actually all coming from one sample. Suppose that I hypothesize people will be happier with their job after getting a raise compared to before. Here I'd be assessing the same group of people before and after something. That means at two different points in time. So I would collect data from folks before, and then I'd assess that same group again after they get their raise. Now in this case, I'm expecting the mean satisfaction with the job to be lower in folks before getting their raise compared to after. In this circumstance, because I'm indicating the direction of change, that there will be more happiness later, this would require a one-tailed test because we have a directional or one-tailed hypothesis. However, if I had simply hypothesized that happiness would be different before versus after getting the raise, then I would be using a two-tailed test because I have a non-directional hypothesis and thus I need a two-tailed test of that hypothesis. Next up is ANOVA. ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. I'll be discussing the simple or one-way ANOVA. ANOVA is useful if we're trying to compare the means of three or more groups. The simple ANOVA is basically an independent samples t-test for when you have three or more groups. Let's say that I hypothesize that cat owners, dog owners, and bird owners spend different amounts of money on their pets. In an ANOVA, we typically don't have it set up as one-tailed or two-tailed because by default we're typically asking a two-tailed question which is whether any of the groups are different from any of the other groups. It could be that the cat owners are spending a lot more than the other two groups or maybe that bird owners spend more than the other two groups or even that bird owners spend more than dog and cat owners but that dog owners also spend more than cat owners. There's lots of combinations that can be happening here. So I won't really be going into one-tailed or two-tailed tests here for simple ANOVA. But let's focus on what this text test is used for. It's used to compare the mean of something quantitative in three or more distinct groups. Now, why wouldn't we just use independent samples t-tests here? In fact, the independent samples t-test formula is a bit simpler to use than the ANOVA formula, but it creates an issue for us when we have three or more groups. To test this, I would actually need to use three independent samples t-tests, one to look at cats versus dogs, another to look at cat owners versus bird owners, and still another to look at dog owners versus bird owners. When I do three different tests, not only am I creating more work for myself, but I'm also increasing the risk of having a type 1 error. This does not please a researcher. We don't want to have a lot of type 1 error because that's a false positive, and we're trying to reduce that down to less than 5%. But each time I do a t-test or any other statistical test, it typically has about a 5% chance of a false positive, known as a type 1 error. If you add all that up, 
across three tests, there's a 15% chance that at least one of them is going to have a type 1 error. So for these two reasons, the first, that doing three separate t-tests is a lot more work than just doing an ANOVA, and second, and very importantly, that because doing three t-tests triples your risk of having a false positive in at least one of those tests, we use the ANOVA test instead of the independent samples t-test when we have more than two groups to compare. This gets even more cumbersome and creates more risk of a type 1 error if we have more than three groups. For instance, if we have four groups to compare each group to each other group would require six different tests, six different t-tests if we did those instead of an ANOVA. And each of those has a 5% chance of a type 1 error, which adds up to an astounding 30% chance of a type 1 error if we were to do these six individual t-tests. The ANOVA instead takes all these tests and rolls them into one big test as our starting point. Therefore, when we have three or more groups, the best choice is to use an ANOVA. The t-test and the ANOVA are used to compare the means of groups, but sometimes we're interested in looking at two. The correlation is used to see if two quantitative variables relate. That keyword relate is a good clue that your hypothesis requires a correlation. Now, when we're looking at two variables, the type of correlation being done is called a bivariate correlation, also sometimes known as a Pearson's correlation or a PPMC, which stands for a Pearson's product moment correlation. These names are essentially synonymous. Suppose that I hypothesize that height, a quantitative variable, relates to weight, another quantitative variable. To test this, I would use a correlation. Now, when I'm simply stating that two things will relate, then my hypothesis will require using a two-tailed test. But if instead I hypothesize that height positively related to weight, I'd be saying that the taller you are, the more you weigh, and the shorter you are, the less you weigh. These are positive relationships. If I posit a direction by saying positive here, then I would use a one-tailed test to test my hypothesis. The same is true if I had said negatively here. If I hypothesize that two things negatively relate, I also would be using a one-tailed test for my hypothesis. I could collect data on this and plot it on an x-y axis, where height is on the x-axis and weight is on the y-axis. You can also flip those around. It doesn't actually affect anything here in a correlation. I then plot my data using dots to indicate the location of each person based on his or her height or weight. And in correlation, what we're looking for is some kind of pattern, like an upward trend or a positive trend in this case, in the dots. The main limitation that we want to keep in mind when we're using correlation is that correlation cannot help us determine causality. That is, we cannot tell about cause-effect relationships among variables when we do a correlation. Instead, what we're able to do is see if the two variables relate to one another on a linear graph. Our final test to consider is the regression. Regression is appropriate when we want to predict one quantitative variable using another quantitative variable. The regression builds upon correlation. What we're doing in regression is saying, if two things are related, then one should help us predict the other. Therefore, if we see a clear trend in our graph, then we can use the position of each of the dots to approximate, based on someone's height, what would their potential weight be? In this sense, we are predicting weight using height. Notice here I put the predictor on the x-axis and the predicted on the y-axis. So theoretically, our independent variable goes on the x-axis and is used to predict, and our dependent variable typically goes on the y-axis and, uh, and is the thing we are predicting. But we need to keep in mind that 
that because this builds upon correlation, we cannot determine causality. The word predict in regards to regression means using one to get a good estimate of what the other one is likely to be, but it doesn't mean fortune telling or knowing the future. It simply means based on the data I have, here's my best guess about what somebody's score would be on that Y variable given their X variable or their X value. That would mean if someone told me they were five foot five, I would locate the position for five foot five on my graph and I'd find the corresponding weight and that would be my best guess or my prediction as to what I'm gonna find out that person's weight actually is. So now that we reviewed each one, let's take a look at a few key words that are associated with each of the tests to help you know when to use each one. The independent samples t-test, dependent samples t-test, and ANOVA tend to use indicators such as compared to to state that groups are being compared. Also look for any indication of what those groups could be, that is the qualitative variable, and make sure that there seems to be some kind of quantitative outcome. That would let you know that you're using one of these three tests. In correlation, we typically hear words like relate or relationship. We might also hear the words positive and negative as qualifiers of the type of relationship. Or if you hear language such as when X increases, Y increases, or when X increases, Y decreases, correlation is the appropriate test. And if you hear the word predict or something that sounds like it, such as guess or estimate, and it sounds like the context is using one variable to predict, guess, or estimate another, then regression is the right choice. Now it's your turn to try it out. I'm going to give you some different hypotheses, and you try to match them to their most appropriate test. Pause here and take a look at each of these hypotheses, then hit play to get the answers. The first hypothesis was that those who study tend to get higher grades than those who do not. We have two distinct groups being compared on something quantitative, their grades, so we would use an independent samples t-test. The second hypothesis is that the more students study, the higher their grades will be. This requires a bivariate correlation because what we're expecting is to see a straight line graph where the more people study, the higher their grades are, and the less they study, the lower their grades are. And our last hypothesis was that the amount of time spent studying would be a good predictor of grades. If we're looking at something as a predictor, then our option is the regression. Pause here and try out three more hypotheses. The first hypothesis that men, women, and children would eat different amounts of calories requires an ANOVA. The next hypothesis is that people will rate their days as more enjoyable after drinking coffee compared to before. We've got that key word there of after and before, key words. So this requires a dependent samples t-test because it's one group of people being tested under two different conditions. And finally, the hypothesis that there is a negative relationship between stress and sleep requires the use of a correlation. Notice here the word relationship appears. That's a pretty good indicator that you need to use a correlation because correlation has the word relation in it. You've just made it through a review of the five commonly used statistical tests. These are taught often in level one statistics classes, and they're some of the most useful foundational tools used by researchers at multiple levels in many different careers.